Okay, and do we want? Hi, everyone out there in interspace world, wherever you are around the world. It's another day, another author. Today was Carlos's day, and we are going to be talking to him. But before we get into that, I have to say this video and the IQFAF is sponsored by Robert Jerome Pagan Creations, and we are promoting our audiobook right now, Pagan Scary Stories Volume 1. And so go ahead and grab that when you're going to grab a copy of Carlos's book, which I have right here, right in front of me. It's on my desk. I know he be, he was like, if you read it or not, I actually have been skimming it and because uh, my husband and I have been really interested. It's just an interesting plot um, and I love horror. But without further ado, I'm going to invite Carlos out Boom. How are you doing, Carlos? Hello. Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you for being a part of the program. I mean, realistically, we wouldn't be able to do the IQFAF if it wasn't for our writers and our filmmakers and our artists. Um, so, and a lot of people have to be on board to like jump on this crazy train of Robertness and go, yeah, like, yeah, let's all collaborate together and do something. So thank you for that. Um, so I think it's very important to understand an artist is to understand their nature and nurture. Um, so I'm going to ask you three questions that will kind of examine that nature and nurture aspect of your life. Um, so okay. the first question, which has three parts, you're going to go, <laughs> I'm such a journalist. The first question has three parts. Uh, the first question is, where did you grow up? What was the most prominent memory from the ages zero to five? What was the most prominent memory from the ages five to 12? And what was the most prominent moment in high school or in your early, early teen puberty ages of discovering who you were? Uh, and we won't talk okay. about college and adult life yet because that will go into your writing because I know that your partner helps you a lot to uh, keep your head on straight. Uh, so that's more that will we'll lean more into the adulthood when we go into the writing. But let's uh, answer those. Okay, so um, I grew up in Costa Rica. I'm, I'm Costa Rican, and I grew up in this very small town named Siquiris. Um, and uh, you know that that did influence me a lot because you know when you live in a small town, it's like everybody knows everybody. Everybody talks about everybody and what was weird with me is that uh, I think the whole town knew I was gay before I knew I was gay and um, <laughs> because you know there there were all of these rumors because oh hmm? did I did I lose you no, sorry I'm right here I'm I'm just enjoy I, it that's funny because I feel that's a very Latino thing that's yeah. a very Hispanic and Latino thing everyone knows before you know, I mean, I knew and I was, I mean, I was dancing and screaming at the age of six on stage. So my parents were like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and what, what happened to me, and, and that comes to like the, the memories between zero to five was that, well, first of all, unlike the other kids in Sikiris, I never liked soccer. And you know that soccer is kind of like a big deal in Latin America. Uh, everybody plays it. I didn't like it. So immediately that labeled me the, well, I don't know if I can say it on YouTube, the FAG, you know. Um, you can say, so, I, so here's the thing. Okay. This, is, this isn't a monetized video. Uh, okay. and I'm not, so, no one really gives a care. I, I think one of our other, we were cussing the other day. Uh, but yeah, well, first of all, I also think language is important. So the word fag is yeah. very important. And yeah. and it, it only because it has a context to us. Like I know a lot of the younger generation, when they hear that word, they're like, uh. but the reason that that word wasn't around before them is because we had it eliminated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it was used so much. Like I remember smear the queer and smear the fag and all those games, like, yeah. You know, traumatic moments in our life. Although now yeah, I would claim them. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, well, the, just the very fact that I didn't play ball with the other kids kind of labeled me like uh, the, the fag in the neighborhood. So it was like this thing that everybody kind of knew. And then there was the other thing. And it was that uh, I remember when I was five, exactly, I joined this, like this singing competition um, okay. for children. And I... 
uh, so my parents had this song in mind that they wanted me to sing, right? Uh, by this male uh, Spanish singer. Uh, but the song I had in mind was this song by Maria Conchita Alonso uh, called La Loca, <laughs> which, uh, okay, so for those not familiar with it, it means the crazy woman. But in Latin America, La Loca would be the way to refer to a gay male man, you know? Uh, so it had that perception from people. And I had that song in my head. And then I got on stage and I started singing that in front of the entire town. <laughs> and my parents wanted to kind of like die. In moment. <laughs> but I won. I actually, I actually won. But uh, yeah, let's let's just say that there there were signs, very early signs. Um, then um, there was the other question was about my time in high school, right? Like when I was a middle teenager, school, like middle school area, middle, middle school? school. Well, yeah. we don't really have middle school here in Costa Rica. Uh, we just have high school. Uh, for us, okay. that's from seventh to um, to the eleventh grade, um, and uh, yeah, for for me that was painful because I came from this very small town to this uh, high school in the capital in San Jose, which was full of you know really how to say it, like more mature, kind of more preppy, more uh, financially stable people I guess than I was and for them I was like the country bumpkin and not just that but also kind of gay yeah. so, <laughs> so that resulted in a lot of bullying that resulted in me kind of being ostracized um, and a lot of teasing a lot of things that happened there but the the funny thing was that by the time I graduated high school I had actually made a fairly stable, great group of friends that that really uh, that I really got along with. Uh, but it was a difficult time because, despite that, uh, growing up in such a conservative town, as far as being a Catholic town with a lot of uh, evangelical religions, also, um, it meant that I couldn't really talk about my being gay. In fact, I didn't accept myself as gay at the time, despite the fact that probably since I've been like, what, 13, 14, I was kind of already sexually active. So um, it was it was kind of tough. But it was one of those things in which I was, I knew what I was, I just denied it. Like a lot of people do. And, and that's very common here. Yeah, I, I think it's common everywhere. I think people also have a misconception of, Amer of the United States as uh being somewhere where people are very out and proud. I mean, there are secular places in that. And, and now it's totally different because yeah. the <laughs> political climate's totally different. But like, yeah, it, it, it's one of those, it, it's one of those things. I, I think that we all, that as a queer community, I think we are one of the only genres of people or communities of people that transcend all boundaries, all religions, all ethnic groups, all countries, everywhere. We're, we're queer people are like the silent spies of America, you know, around the world. That's why they always say we have an agenda because we're everywhere. They're like, they must have an agenda. And there's always going to be that that back and forth, you know, like we take two steps forward, they push us one step back, and then we take two steps forward, and they kind of try to figure out how to, uh, like, okay, so now we can't mess with this particular aspect of the LGBTQ community. Uh, now let's try to mess with this other group within that community, since this one is becoming stronger. And it, it's kind of like an endless cycle that just doesn't seem to end. It, it happens here, too. Yeah, and I, I yeah, it's it, it's it's one of I could talk for days about it. I post about it all the time. But your book, <laughs> that's yeah. what I, I I have your book in front of me right now, and something that you said spoke to me already. Mm -hmm. Um, you said you grew up in a religious evangelical town, uh, and one of the things that really drew me to the premise of your book was that there was this one lady with Alzheimer's who speaks to God. Um, and she is the messenger to that town. Uh, and there are two things that kind of correlate to me in in very interesting way with that was one, the the one woman speaking to God is very indigenous in a very like in a cultural 
Latin American indigenous way. I, I, I'm Puerto Rican, Mexican, French, and American Native American. American Native American, uh, Ojibwe. So like when I look at that, I see very interesting parallels to an earlier culture where queer queer representation was even more prevalent without even knowing what queer was. So like touching that, I was very interested in that. So what, what drew that premise to you? Because it's a very interesting way to, especially a character with the Alzheimer's, and like, and I, cause I have personally write, wrote characters that think that they're talking to God or talk to God or talk to angels. Personally, I've, I've been there. So like, what was that thought process for you? And like, how did that like play out? Cause I really found so, that very interesting. So putting the Alzheimer's aside, uh, uh, because that, that wasn't originally part of the premise, you know, the character of, of Martha Lang, uh, she's my mother or like my mother used to be, uh, which is why in the in the dedication of the book, I, I dedicate part of it also to my parents. And one of the things I say there is, uh, this refers to a time in which, you know, to a time long past, and this is not a relationship anymore. My mother used to be a very fanatical uh, Christian. And by fanatical, I mean the kind that said that she spoke to God, that the angels spoke to her. Uh, and she and this instead of meaning like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be this force for good in the world. She became this force for discrimination, not just for me, but for pretty much everyone around me. So for me, obviously, the fact that I'm that I was gay, that meant I was this disobedient son that was going to go to hell i was cursed i was evil i had to change and she had this concept and that's where where martha uh, takes a lot from my mother she had this concept that it was something that god had promised that i would come back to her that i would return to her somehow which in her head meant one day i was going to change stop being gay and just align with her beliefs so that's where that character is is born from that very fanatical way of speaking many of the things that the character says uh to to her son to other people are things that i've you know that my mother has said to to me and other people um thankfully my relationship with her now is much better she has changed a lot she accepts me my husband everything but at the time like let's say five years back you know from five years to my childhood there she was always this force of judgment of unfair expectations and of God is going to send you to hell if you don't change. So even though the religion in the book isn't necessarily Christian, uh, the kind of uh, fanatical uh, belief and fanaticism that she has is very much based on my mother. The Alzheimer's uh, for me was an interesting thing because for me, it always felt like my mom changed beliefs as it was convenient to her. Mm -hmm. Like it was... Uh, like she seemed to forget things that she had said before mm. just so she could change them to what best suited her at a particular time. So uh, when I was thinking of how to portray that, uh, the Alzheimer's became this thing of, okay, so what if this character just uh, forgets that I'm an adult and treats me like a child? What if she feels that uh, I just had a fight with her yesterday that happened, you know, when I was 14? You know, that's where that aspect came in. I like that. I, that that's an interesting interpretation to do. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah. The other thing that it was very interesting, the other thing that's very interesting about your book uh, is the time jumps. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit and what, because uh, I also, not necessarily in my books, actually, no, not necessarily in my books, but in some of my films, time jumps are like a big talking point of what I do. Um, and it, it's just an interesting way. I, I felt like it's an interesting way to write a novel um, because it's harder. It is. <laughs> and I, I like, so I like, if you have to be honest, it is harder to... Yeah. convey and do it well and which i do feel like you do it really well uh and there's points where you change uh time periods in the middle of a chapter which 
which was interesting to me because I was like, okay, this is new. But like, I think that's what intrigues me to read more, to yeah. be honest, is that it feels different and it feels, yeah, it just feels so new. Um, where, where would you contrive that? But why, why, why of the time, like what made that come apparent into the writing? Cause it's a big part of the book. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> and it, it continues maybe at a, at a not so intense way in book two, it's a little bit more controlled in book two, but it still continues. Same in book three, which I'm writing right now. So the thing is, it, there's two reasons to it. One of them was that one of my inspirations for the book is pretty obviously Stephen King's It, even though there are no evil clowns or <laughs> things like that. There's that in, that uh, coming of age kind of aspect to it, which influences the time jumps and how what happened before influences what happened now, what's happening now, I'm sorry, um, but also because of the theme of the story. So one of the big themes which comes from my own queer experience is uh, the notion of expectations. So religious expectations, uh, gender expectations, parental community, all of these expectations that we carry as adults were put on us most likely when we were children. And they come from all of these different sources. So you have these characters that when they were children, they had a very different life from what we have right now. So just to throw a couple of very general examples without spoilers. So we have uh, this, uh, this character, Nadine, that she used to be this carefree, popular, athletic girl in, in school that everybody seemed to like. Now she seems to be kind of like the... The, the person that has no life and has kind of dedicated her life to taking care of others and forgot about taking care of herself. So her arc has to do with her dealing with, wait, do I want to live for myself or do I want to live for someone else? Uh, then we have, for example, a character like Barry, who is one of my favorite characters in the book. And this might be a little bit spoilerish, but you know, it, it, by now it's book two, so I'm okay with it. Um, he starts as the school bully, like the character that tends to be very uh, a, a caricature that we all experienced as children, uh, who then later becomes a very close friend of the protagonist. Uh, but this is a person that could have grown up to be a very stable human being based on his evolution. But because of the homophobia from his mother, this is a man that grew up to marry a woman, have children, despite the fact that he is gay, you know, and uh, he, that's, that's his big arc throughout the story. This idea of, I have all of these expectations put on me that I'm supposed to be a heterosexual man, that I'm supposed to marry, that I'm supposed to have a wife, and now as an adult, I didn't get to live my life because of those expectations. So that's why the time shifts. That idea of these things that happened when I was a child put all of this weight on me now that I'm an adult. I like that. Uh, I, it's also like I, I write I, my t TV series or my film series saga, Last Gasp, has very similar parallels to that. We were talking about that yeah. earlier, but like I, I, it's one of those things that I do find very refreshing i also find your your dialogue refreshing um sometimes i feel dialogue can be a little stiff um and being someone who likes film and coming from a theater background um dialogue has to seem natural to me um and i do feel like you find a very interesting voice with the majority of your characters and they do feel different like they don't feel like they're speaking from one voice and <sighs> people will hate me for saying this uh i mean i used to read a lot of dan brown but that was probably the biggest reason why i don't like reading dan brown anymore is i feel like it's too singular of a voice um it's a little too white male for me uh and and doesn't have like they're like and every character just sounds the same uh where this i just don't feel that has that um when you're looking at character development i do know that you originally came from the theater world did that, do you think, play a little bit of hand in develop, developing characters into your book? Yes. And uh, when I was uh, when I was studying, I, I didn't go to college to study theater. I, I 
kind of joined a theater group and then I started learning from there and getting taught like all the basics and stuff. Um, and then I was with them for about five, six years. Um, one of the first things that they taught me, uh, and I remember my the, the director, Mercedes, she told us like, so go out all of you to that park out there and start looking at people. Just start looking at people, look at their mannerisms, look at what they're doing, kind of if they're having a conversation, kind of think about what they might be talking about. And then come here, pick one of those people and show us what they were doing or or show us what they were talking about. And uh, that also translates very well to writing. There's a lot of not just me and people that I've known in my life in those characters, uh, but also people that I have, you know, observed or people that I have uh, passingly, you know, known in my life uh, that I put in those characters. And, and, that, and that helps to that sincerity. The other thing is that when you mention somebody, for example, Dan Brown, uh, I've only read like the Da Vinci Code, but it's like everybody, like most people, <laughs> but um, most people look at dialogue as this thing in which people need to make these grandiose statements with everything like one of the things they tell you when you write is that everything you write needs to have meaning but it doesn't necessarily mean that every character is going everything that every character says needs to be this profound thing it can just be like maybe the way that they're dismissive of what somebody else said and they're just like ah shut the hell up you know uh, and that can tell you something about the character it's not important necessarily to the plot, but it's important to understand who that character is. And a, a lot of writers think that every time their character writes, it needs to be this, uh, you know, uh, Aragorn to his army before going into Mordor uh, kind of speech. You know? <laughs> and uh, I don't think that's how people talk. No, I, I agree. I mean, even in my... <laughs> In my film, people say shit that like like why why do they say it like, like there has no reason for the plot. I, I will say this definitely, uh, Damien in particular, uh, in part because of the because of the actor mm -hmm. that played him both in the on the play and the and, and the in the series, the dialogue feels very naturally like something you know that person. Well, that's also because the character is based off of me. Uh, there you go. And and so the actors were like, what? As an adult, they were watching me. Uh, so I, there, we also did a lot of character work, a lot of character work. But I also wanted to write characters that didn't seem pretentious. Yep. <laughs> like I like I also because I also even felt, when they are being pretentious. Yes. And that <laughs> and that's and that and that's a point because Damien in, in himself is very pretentious, but he I didn't want him to come off that way. I wanted him to come off. A pretentious asshole. Not, I didn't want him to be Fraser. <laughs> like, yeah. When, exactly. when he could, when he could easily have been Fraser, and the, like there, there, that's what I'm saying. Your di dialogue has moments of that. It really does have moments of like, oh, that's a throwaway line, but it's not a throwaway line because it's actually more giving you a context of who the internal person is versus the external show that they're putting forth. So like. Yeah. A lot of my characters, yeah, they want to speak in speeches. Damien and Rick probably speak the most metaphorically, but I think that's because they parallel each other a lot. Like Rick is looking back at Damien. But but it does feel natural, and, that, and that's the important thing. Like, obviously, like, if, if you read any of my books, you're going to find that there will be times in which a character does exposition. That's normal. Like, for example, a character like like Martha, because of her religious proselytizing way, she can get away with more, you know, unnatural kind of speeches, which strangely, that's how my mom talks. But, <laughs> but I mean, like when, um, when, when you have a, like one of the kids or one of the other characters, you're just joking or something like right. that, you know, it's like for, at one point there's there's this character jess uh that i love that she one of one of them has like a sip of beer and she just brings out like a rag and you know uh runs it over his face and she goes like here looks like you have cum in your mustache <laughs> you know? 
you know, it's no, that, that, yeah. that it's natural. It's what like it's natural. That's the thing that I like books and things that tell the story of life. Uh, even when there's metaphorical or supernatural. And here's the other thing is I can definitely tell that you were going with the idea of, I could tell you were a Stephen King fan, um, but mainly because I could feel that you wanted to succeed at building something that had a world that we could see, yeah. but wasn't over. So like the good thing, the thing about Stephen King that I do like is that he creates worlds that are very visual without being Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Like, and like I always tell people, I cannot stand Two Towers. It was my least favorite Tolkien book. I hate it. I hate that book. I hate it so much. Like, it took me almost a year and a half to finish it. I loved Fellowship. I loved Return of the King. But darn it. You don't need to talk about political landscape as much as you do. And that's and that's just how so like I I appreciate long wind with purpose, not yeah. long wind just to like, and then the trees are gorgeous because they have a crack in them. And let's talk about this crack for nine minutes. Oh, and yeah, I mean, it has its place in writing. I have ADHD, so that place in writing is not for me. Like, I just can't, I can't do that. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you about, because it did confuse me, and I think I just answered my own question, because I totally, I, when I skim books, I just skim, and I read random chapter just to kind of fill it. And then I read a chapter two, and then I read a chapter two again. And then I just realized it's because this book has your novella in it too, right? Is that, yes, yep. there we go. Should I read the full novella before reading the full you don't have to but it helps it's it's uh so it's a it's a standalone story so it's it's uh in the beginning of the book i mentioned this case that happened in the vanik house about a family in which the the father you know kind of lost it and killed his family and apparently ate them <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that was in 1968 so that's that story kind of like showing what's rumor, what isn't, and what actually happened. So it's very self-contained. Uh, so you don't need to know anything about the story going into that one. But if you read book two, having read that, it gives you like an extra. Okay. Again, not necessary, but it helps. It's kind of like, not necessarily, you don't have to watch the play version of Last Gas, but if you do, it does help give you some extra content. Yes, because because one of the things that I did in book one, and that, that for me is the biggest risk of book one, uh, was that, well, book one in a trilogy is always world building. and But you need to have some plot, but you're asking people to trust you that you're going somewhere with it. Uh, and for those that read book one and got to book two, which thankfully have been quite a few, so that makes me happy. <laughs> um what I've gotten from them is, oh, I get it. This book hits the ground running. Book two is like, okay, so yeah, the, the, this book gets nasty. And it hits because of what you established here. And one of the reviewers, one of the things he said was that, man, you really didn't waste a sentence in book one. Because he realized that may, even those little things that I may have put there that seem like, oh, this is just kind of like a background character, like a, like a, what to say, like an anecdote that you mentioned. Oh, no, that's actually in book two. That actually makes sense. That totally informs what's happening here. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very intentional about that. It's a risk, but, you know. I like risk. You have to take risk. I think, like, if you... If you're if you're creating art, you have to take risk. Otherwise, you can be Dan Brown, which I've read all. I've read all. I've read all Dan Brown novels. So like I'm I like I literally have read them all. I say you can't make fun of something unless you've actually read it or actually watched. It. So I have definitely uh, watched all those things. Um, book two goes into the more queer space uh, yeah. of of your your story so i don't want people to be like no first of all 
every anything by a queer author is queer. So there you go. But I could see the the queer coding. Like you, you do do some queer coding. I also like. I'm just praising you now. I also like that you're not scared of using politically incorrect language. Yeah, because it tells the story of characters. Yeah, exactly. And okay, I'll say this: Book three, even though it's not out, there's one scene in uh, near the beginning of book three in which let's just say I use a word that I know I'm not supposed to use because I'm not supposed to use it because mm. that's not my word, but a character uses it. Mm, yeah. And it, and it's because that character would have used it because he wants to get a reaction and he's doing it on purpose to get a reaction. So for me, uh, I mean, I, I understand that our world now, we need to make sure that we're sensitive to uh, to pretty much everybody's feelings and everything, but also we need to be true to what's out there, you know? And not everybody out there is sensitive. Not everybody out there watches their language. Not everybody out there uh, uses... When I have a scene of, of Barry's mom treating him... Uh, you know, saying like, are, are, are you, are you a faggot? Are you, you know, and she says it with such contempt and such hate, you know, while she's beating him, that that scene hurts. Yeah. And why, that, yeah. why do I put that there? Because that happened to me. Yeah, so I mean, Barry, Barry is not my standing in the story, but that happened to me. So if I tone it down, I'm not being honest to the character or to myself. And even to, to his mother, who's a horrible human being. I, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take a limb and say this and people will probably get pissed off at me, but whatever. Um, I feel like it is the job. It is the job of artists to be harshly honest and to not censor themselves and to not cater to sensitivity because and and this is this is very important especially here in the united states because a lot of this bull crap comes from us um, <laughs> um I, I i will agree with you on that when when <laughs> I will agree it comes from America. It comes from you guys, Robert. Uh, no, because when you're too sensitive, you allow too much censorship. And at some point, you cannot censor because of the way you feel. Because when you're censoring because of the way you feel, you've inherently taken away from freedom from someone else. Yeah. And, and I think that that is something that people don't, realize and i think that it is an artist's job to put different people in front of people art is a safe place to hear those words to discover those things i hope to god no one ever has to be beaten by their mother and called a fag i hope to god no one ever has to go through half of the crap that you know damien and his friends go through in last gasp but the reason why you write it and the reason why you film it and the reason why you portray it is because it's truth. It's what happens go. in the world. And if we deny the truth, we allow us to be censored in a whole different way. And like yeah. I, I am, I am Afro Rican. I am black. I have a, a United States citizen and a black American, but I do not agree with removing Confederate statues. I feel like it it hides our history. And yes, which were, risks repeating it, which risks repeating it, which once we started taking them down, we got Trump. So like once we started hiding that crazy history, we then made it OK for other people like DeSantis to change Florida's education system to hide slavery to hide homosexuals, 
to hide parts of our history. And so like, that's why I feel it refreshing that your characters speak very naturally, especially for like, I also put into my mind that you're from a Latin American country. And then I remember, and I know all my Latin American relatives who are in Latin America or my Caribbean relatives who are in Puerto Rico and how they talk. And, and like, it's like, no, like, like they're not going to be sitting around. I'm so sorry that they are no longer a cisgender person. It makes me so sad that all humans can't. No, they're not going to say that because it's not in their vocabulary. It's not that they're homophobic. It's not that they're racist. It's that it's just not in their vocabulary. And, and, they, and it it's, doesn't technically need to be. And it's, it's I think it's a it's a matter of of respecting the individual uh, that you have in front of you. Yes. Because, for example, I mean, personally, uh, well, because of Spanish, we have our language is gendered. You know, we have male and female words. And then uh, when they came out with the gender neutral words, a lot of people pushed back. And most people, if I would say 90, 95% of people in Spanish don't use gender neutral uh you know words because in 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 our language it sounds weird but if i meet a person hmm. and that person tells me you know uh i'm i'm gender neutral uh my my pronouns are they them which in spanish it would mean that instead of using a or o to end words i would use e i will talk to that person and about that person using that because it's me respecting the person, but it it doesn't mean that every word that comes out of my mouth I need I need to start measuring everything. And and when you when you're writing a book and when you're writing characters, uh, I mean people don't really speak like that. Like in um like for example, in now you were asking me about the about the novella that I included there. Um, there's a uh, well I I would say either trans or gender neutral character there but it happened in 1968 and what i wanted to show was that the character that is meeting this character might not feel comfortable with that idea like i can't apply today's sensibilities to 1968 did gender neutral pronouns exist at that time of course they did of course they did but you know uh joe hill from you know around the corner didn't use them unless the person specifically told them hey talk to me like this so that that's actually the thing if we show that insensitivity of other times and we feel uncomfortable with it that's the idea if you feel uncomfortable with seeing that happen that is telling you hey be more sensitive but if we don't show it then we're not we're not showing a reason to be more sensitive yeah, no, I completely agree. Like my and and I agree on the ideology. Like I will call a, I will call you whatever you want me to call you. Like that's just like that that's just the way I am. You tell me what you want to be called and I will call you that. If you want to be called Flapjack, I will call you Flapjack. If you want to be, you know, like just tell me what you want to be called. Um, but I also think that your point on the 1960s language and portraying it to today goes into everything and that that actually kind of leans into my next question and we kind of you talked about this in, in a post a bit too uh but like what would be your favorite queer classic literature writer or like so you know someone that wouldn't have thought of these time period but would still have expressed queer culture oh wow <laughs> that 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 stuff because uh so here we didn't really have much access to queer literature when I was growing up. So as far as classic, classical writing, I, I don't have that much. But I did mention uh, Carmilla, which was a book 
that uh, that I read that was like end of the 18th century, I believe. Uh, and this was written before Dracula. And it's about a lesbian vampire. And they actually made several films in which they needed to use queer coding to kind of hide the fact that the character was, you know, a lesbian, because the director, the writer of the movie wanted to make it a little bit more explicit. But because back then, in, in the times of the black and white movies, that was not allowed. So it needed to be coded. Uh, so that reading that book is a good example of how you can find that we've always been here. Uh, we've always been in literature. We've always been in books. Uh, maybe we just need to look for them a little for for ourselves a little bit more. Yeah, and I like I like that because I I always like when uh, we can find something that's not English that can trump some of the English writers. Uh, so like, or some of the well, more well known European writers. And so like that was I actually put that on my list of books to purchase. Because I was like, oh, that sounds like such an interesting vampire story. Because I love vampires. Now you are a horror writer. I would, I would like. I guess you're horror, but I would almost say more like thriller, suspense, horror, real. Like I just don't know where to put you because it's enjoyable. Like I love. I, 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 and that, I'm not that, mean, say that, that means you haven't that, that means you haven't read the hardest parts of the book or book. Yeah, no, exa exactly. So I haven't gotten I haven't like I said I haven't gotten to there yet. Uh, but like so like would you say that this would fall squarely in that horror or what would you? So for me it's so for me it is horror. It's supernatural horror, cosmic horror, uh, but yeah. it's not splatterpunk. So. That's the thing with me. I I can I can watch a splatterpunk movie like uh, I oh god I, I I like like Terrifier. You know I can watch it. I can enjoy it, but it's not my main genre. I'm more for something like a little bit more spooky, more atmospheric, more if if there's blood, it's blood with uh, with a reason. Um, so I, I yeah I would say more like supernatural and cosmic horror because it, it's supposed to be about like you know all those things that we can't explain or we can't control. I like that. The, like I mean, supernatural horror, cosmic horror. I like that. I also like that's what that's what because when I'm reading, it doesn't read to me like a horror novel because the writing is good. Like, well, no, it just. Most horror, most horror writers have a certain way of writing horrors. It's like you're reading a B horror movie. And I don't like, I don't feel like that. I feel like I'm reading a novel. It's almost like when, and people are going to hate me for saying this. It's almost like when I was reading Harry Potter for the first time, I didn't feel like I was reading a fantasy book. Mm -hmm. Although that would be considered a fantasy book. Like, yeah, but if, if you go by like the first book, it sounds more like a, like a children's book that like a fairy tale thingy than a, than say fantasy per se, but yeah, I, I get it. No, and 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 the thing is, the way I do it is, if I fill every page with blood and gore, uh, it loses its, its impact. Yeah. So I, I want it to be very intentional. Those those scenes uh, that are there that are very intentionally gory or violent or you know, just horrifying conceptually. Uh, in book two, it does get a little bit more into the violence of things, mm -hmm. but still trying to keep that. Uh, I'm very character focused. So that thing that you were mentioning before about taking risks, for me, book two, the reason it was risky is because I'm kind of shuffling the horror, violence, blood, and supernatural things with a love story. Okay. So you're, you're going through all of these horrible things and then you go to the scene in which there's zero horror, just two people developing the relationship. But then that informs, you know, what happens later in the book, uh, whether it's good or bad or the things they go through. You care more about what they're going through because, oh, wait, I care about these people. I, I don't want anything bad to happen to these people. So uh, I hope they make it through. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you, because 
it's something that I took a risk with in one of my films. I appreciated the Spanish without interpretation. Uh -huh. um, and in, in American Posada, I really did. They, they spoke Spanish and they just spoke Spanish. Uh, but like, and that's something that I find interesting. One, because it causes people who don't speak Spanish to go and look it up. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't speak Spanish. So like, I wish I did, but I do not speak Spanish. My husband speaks Spanish. But like, I really love when writers trust in their characters enough mm -hmm. to say, because I've seen, like, I've read a lot of books where like the character speaks in Spanish, but everything is in English. And and that is a way, uh, you know, and it's a way to write a book, but I, I just feel like it loses the honesty. And like when Roberta speaks in Spanish, she speaks in Spanish. And I like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's one thing that, uh, that I admired also from Gavino Iglesias. He wrote this book called, uh, the devil takes you home, uh, mm. which is really amazing. It's kind of like a supernatural gangster, Mexican gangster noir book. It's amazing. And it has these whole stretches of characters just speaking Spanish. And they don't tell you what they said until maybe later. Okay. And and you have the and you have the 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 non-Spanish speaking character just standing there while you have this old Mexican lady talking to her son in Spanish. Uh, so it kind of asks the reader for that trust of oh I'm not missing any story here. What I think is maybe I will look it up to see what I might be missing or see if they explain it later. In my case. I wanted the Spanish to be a small part of it at the very least, because one of the things that Martha, Peter's mom, does is that she's done a complete erasure of his father, who is Costa Rican. So she even erased his last name. Peter's actual last name is Rojas. And uh, she, after his dad was out of the picture, she changed it to Lang to her own last name. She wanted to erase him completely. So uh, it's ironic that that woman wanted to be friends with Roberta, who is also a Spanish speaker, and she herself learned to speak Spanish to understand it. But in her own son, she wants to erase everything uh, that is Hispanic because it reminds her of her husband. Um, and through the story, there will be those moments uh, Maybe in book one and two, not so much, but there are those moments in which Peter will kind of long a little bit for that. Uh, oh, my, my father used to do this. Or, or yeah, that's that's a piece of Spanish that my dad taught me, um, which would, would come to play much later. But it's, it's that idea of even if somebody tries to erase who we are, we are who we are. Yeah. You yeah, know, and I... I... Another parallel with Last Gasp, Damien deals with that a lot. He talks of, you know, being a white Puerto Rican. He is black. He is Latin. He, you know, but he is very passing. And he talks about his not fitting in anywhere. And then throwing the queerness on top of that yeah. and throwing in the erasure of, of his his heritage by his parent. Like, I, I find... There's things that draw me to it. And and I also think when you're talking about a coming of age series um, and you're able to jump from children to men to like, and you're able to see this progression, it takes a lot, a lot of just trust, not only in the reader, but trust in the writer in knowing their own character. Because like you're, you're having to write from backstory that you know you may use in in three or four and is this going to be a trilogy or are we going to go to four it's a trilogy it's a trilogy you're you're like i'm done after three it's going to be <laughs> wrapped up yeah the, this one so this one was a a story that i had planned i mean I, I wrote a short story uh 20 years ago that was only peter and martha and peter's son and that that was the story just the three of them um and that gave me the framework for this one so i when i planned it and i started thinking about the town the characters the different themes and all of that i ended up with this huge story 
that I said, you know what, I want to just tell this one big story. And from there, most likely what I'll do is one shots, like just one novel, one story. But for me, this is my trilogy. This is the one that that for me needed to be told this way. Um, is it the last time that we're going to see White Harbor? Most likely not. But if we do see White Harbor in another novel, it will be something completely different. I like that. I, I, I mean, just... I, 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 was I was joking with a friend of mine that one day what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a novel about, uh, you know, uh, some scientists discovering an unknown creature in an island of the coast of Japan named Shiro Minato, which means White Harbor. <laughs> and that story is going to be in Japan and it's going to be about a giant monster. That's funny. I, uh, I, I'm very similar, like an American Posada took place in a, a town called Trilberry. Um, and now I have a movie in American Posada was 1968, 1950s. Like, like that's when that movie was set. And now I have a horror movie coming out called Trilberry Murders, which takes place in 2022 and is some of the characters are related to some of the people inside American Posada, but it's a totally different time. And this is a raunchy co a comedy. And that one was a family wholesome movie. So like, it's it's literally like the Trillberry, I do have a lot. Um, yeah, it, and like, it, so it, for example, inside Trillberry Murders, the per they watch Last Gasp as a TV show, as if it's euphoria in their timeline. So there's a lot, you know, uh, and the character that I play in American in in Oscar winning or Trillberry Murders is actually the director of the fictional version of Last Gasp. So there's like, yeah, there's a, I, I like to play with that. So like I was I was hoping that White Harbor wouldn't disappear because like when you build a world, when you build a world, Carlos, yeah, you, you don't want to let it go. You have to play in it. You have to play yeah. it more. Well, like, one of the things you mentioned was my my influence coming from Stephen King. Stephen King actually has two books, mm -hmm. uh, Desperation and The Regulators, one of which he wrote as Stephen King, the other one he wrote as Richard Bachman. And I, I didn't know this until I read them, but they have the exact same characters playing different roles in two completely different locations, in two completely different stories. The only thing that joins them is the same villain. Well, the same villain. To, they're very different, but it's the same villain, uh, this thing named Tack. And uh, the thing is, for me, that, that was really cool because for me, I, I, it gave me this image of a theater troupe. You know, same actors, different story. So... Um, yeah, that that's that's kind of my future plans with White Harbor, um, but so I, I do have a couple of stories lined up that I would do there, but those would be just like one novel stories. This is just the only trilogy. Now, one of the biggest things out right now is audiobooks. Are you on your way to getting uh, this on audiobook yet, or? Yes. So uh, book one has already been recorded by uh, Molly Rock. She's a, a voice artist. She's amazing. And uh, she's currently in the editing process uh, of the audiobook. So my guess is before the release of book three, most likely we should have the audiobook ready. So I, I will be announcing that. But uh, the moment I, I heard her, I was like, yeah, you, you're you're the right person for this. I, I need you to do Martha and I need you to voice Jess and, you know, she's just the right person. That's awesome. I, I just happen to, because I'm so busy, I'm able to, to enjoy audiobooks way more because I'm able to be on the run and listening to it. So I was like, oh, I hope this comes out soon because I would devour this as an audio, <laughs> as an audio book. I could just, cause I can hear it. Like I can hear it. You know, I just, yeah, I can just yeah. hear it. I also think that it would make some really good short films. So I'm hoping that you are looking into um, getting some independent people and maybe doing your own little short, putting it on YouTube or something to help advertise the book. But like, this is a good story, man. Like there's there's so much you can do with this. This is what IQFAF is about, is, is also making <laughs> artists grow. And I think that 
So just just to to throw it out there, so I do actually have um uh, I do actually have a pitch deck, but not for a movie, but for a a ten episode series. Oh, a limited based yeah, on limited this, series. and it it covers the entire trilogy. So it's uh I mean I've been trying to sell it around. Uh, I, there's been a couple people that have read it, uh, and have told me that they were interested, but you know how that is they say i'm interested and then you don't hear back for forever or maybe next week i'll hear from them but um that's that's I, I, that's really my ultimate goal to put this on screen in front of people i would uh i would always say and this is what i tell everyone if you wait for them to say yes it will never get made exactly uh so i always say find one section out of the three that would make a great 15 20 minute concept short film that you'll get more yeses because they want to see what it looks like and they want to see you have the ability to do it most production places aren't paying for for things anymore they're paying for you know because streaming it's just totally different yeah totally different it's changed the world just like Kindle printing and stuff has changed publication and things like that. And the difference between where you are a part of a public publication house, this is uh, produced through a publication house. <laughs> Some of our authors and, and, and personally, I do a lot of self-publishing, but like the world has just changed to allow so many different types of art to be out there yes. that it's we're saturated, but not with enough of this. We're saturated with too much remakes of Willy Wonka. So, right. <laughs> Carlos, we have talked for over an hour. I I noticed that, and 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 because I'm it's just been in, fun. <laughs> I am like literally enjoying enjoying it, and now my husband's calling me because he's on his lunch break. But what would be the one thing before we go? What would be the one thing that you would say to a young queer? writer who is at home crying thinking that they are no good what would you say to them so if you have an idea if, if you have a story that you want to tell uh just write it and the first draft is gonna suck and it's gonna be horrible but at least it's gonna be on the fir- on the page and then you can just go back and edit it and turn it into the story you really wanted. And the reason why you should write it, even if you don't believe that it's going to be good, is because we tend to self-sabotage a lot. We tend to have a lot of imposter syndrome. And if I had, I mean, I waited 20 years to write this story that I had. Uh, and maybe if I hadn't waited that long, who knows how many novels I would already have out. So don't do what I did. Don't wait 20 years. Write it now. Get it out there. Somebody is going to enjoy it, even if it's just one person. So uh, if if you don't get it done, it's not going to do itself. I agree. I I really, really love talking, <laughs> talking with you. So I know that we'll have you back. I also know that next week we'll be announcing a chance for one of our fans to get a beautiful copy of this book mailed to them. So we'll be announcing our raffle, our, 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 yeah, our raffle, I guess, to get that uh, next week. Uh, Also, how can they find it now? Because I know some people are going to be like, I can't wait till next week. I want to get the book now. Where can they buy it? So you can find it on Amazon, uh, you know, as ebook and paperback. You can also find it on Godless as ebook. Uh, also Barnes and Noble on the web page. You can get it there. But if you want the like the, you know, like the paperback book, you can get it on Amazon. Just search for the local truth, White Harbor, uh, and book two is named Blackout. So the local truth, book one, Blackout, book two. And, um, you know, you can also follow me on my socials at Carlos Rivera author. You know, that's basically my my handle everywhere except Twitter. But I don't really use Twitter anymore. So, eh. but so Carlos Rivera author, that's how you find me on uh, Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. 
Awesome. And we'll have links to purchase his book in the, actually, I think there's already a link to purchase the book in the description. So if you're like, I want to get it, just press that link and it will take you right to uh, the Amazon page. Also, like I said, next week, we'll be giving away a copy, not this copy. This is my copy that I've been fondling. So <laughs> don't worry. Your copy is going to be nice and clean and unfondled. Uh, but <laughs> Unless you want this copy, because I can give you a fond of the copy if you want it. Tell me. Um, <laughs> Carlos, I hope again, well, I know we're going to see you again. Uh, definitely in October, we're going to be definitely talking about, probably I want to talk about book two in October a little bit too, and then get you on a horror panel as well. Um, also, thank you for being so supportive. I think that one of the things that people don't realize is we are all small artists. None of us are Dan Brown. None of us are Steven Spielberg. None of us are Stephen King or, you know, we are all making our way in the industries and making our stories heard. And one of the big things that I think that you are succeeding in is connecting with other artists and uplifting them as well. And I always say that in order for you to succeed as an artist, you need to make sure that your friends and your community succeed as well. So thank Absolutely. you for being a part of the IQFAF and doing all this and talking about yourself and your life and your book and everything. I, I just really enjoy it. As you can tell, I, I, I really, I really, yeah. You know, just and Roberta let just me know me. whenever you want to chat again. Uh, I would love to be on anytime you, you want. And, uh, you know, the, you set this up. So give yourself credit too, because uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you and having other people watch this if it weren't because you set this up. So thank you. Uh, and uh, because again, I, I'm as a Costa Rican author, I don't, I might not have as much opportunities as other authors who are directly in the United States and can engage with, with their audience live. So these opportunities for me are priceless. So thank you. And I flipped to a page because I was like, I'm going to flip to a page and I'm going to say a quote from a character. And <laughs> the quote is get out page uh, 172 by Roberta. How, how meta was that? <laughs> <laughs> You're so, thank me out. You. so thank you so much, Carlos. We're going to end the live stream. Have a great one. And of course, like, follow, subscribe, not only his socials, but IQFF uh, forum on Instagram, uh, R. Jerome P on Instagram and Facebook and all the other ones. And don't forget, you're going to be able to get the raffle and look at things at www.rjeromep.com backslash queerlitzer, like the Pulitzer, but with queer in front of it. So I will.